Welcome everyone to today's coffee lecture presentation on the topic of AI tools to start your literature research. My name is Tanya Rivero. I am an information specialist here at the University of Bern Medical Library. The aim for today's session, we will briefly cover considerations when using AI tools, ways in which these tools can help with literature research, AI literacy and use, and we will explore some selected AI tools. And in this part, I will provide a scenario and highlight some of the features per tool. When you are considering using tools, keep in mind that as of yet, search query details are not available. And of course, taking into consideration your projects, something to keep in mind. And though tools have gotten better with respect to hallucinations, they still occur. So be aware of the hallucinations as well as inaccurate summaries. Potential bias uh, is something to look out for. Privacy. Um, some of these tools have included some other privacy settings in which you can opt out. So you have a little bit more uh, control in that respect. And so there are various ways that AI tools can support literature research. For example, it can facilitate a direction for research topic, whether that's through prompting or a visualization feature. It can also help identify synonyms for key concepts, help formulate refined research questions, right? With some prompting, retrieve key um, papers or studies. Uh, highlight connections among papers that were not apparent. Also, it can provide some context into a topic, right? So though you need to be wary of summaries, summaries can be helpful, especially if you are looking for background information. And then, of course, identifying similar papers. And it's important to note that why users are drawn to AI tools. Um, one important thing is that it helps uh, mitigate information overload. And in addition, um, many of the tools, they don't require you to incorporate, right, a robust inquiry, learning various syntax. But with using these tools, AI literacy is something that we need to learn about and ensure that we enhance these skills. The authors Long and Margeko have a wonderful article on AI literacy. And it's kind of providing into, you know, the connections between AI literacy, digital literacy, and competencies that we may need to keep in mind. With that being said, you don't have to be an expert, right, in large language models, right? There is a place where you can start. And when you're using these tools, right, one thing that you want to get good at is identifying which tools use these technologies, which ones don't. Are you able to identify um, the benefits, the full potential of these tools? What does it do really well in? And what are the limitations of these technologies? And for those of you that are embarking on using these tools and perhaps you want to use some kind of checklist or evaluation. Um, authors Wheatley and Hervo have developed a what we call the robot test. And it's a list of self-guiding questions um, that could also be uh, incorporated as you're navigating with these tools. And on the topic of AI literacy, we have to consider how we're going to use and report when we're using these technologies. And specifically for those that are working on master thesis projects um, in the medical faculty in human medicine, in the template, there is a declaration of authorship where if you are using these tools, you need to declare it and provide some information on how that was done. And for those of you that are um, planning to submit your publication. Keep in mind, looking at your target journals, what is written in the policies and author guidelines in terms of what you need to report when you're using these technologies. And 
with these technologies, right, there will probably be other guidelines that you might have to adhere to. So here we have an example from Prisma. Um, Prisma is an established reporting standard for systematic review projects. It also has extensions for reporting protocols as well as scope and reviews. Um, but they now have something where if you're doing a systematic review on AI-based interventions, there is now a reporting standard for that. And so the tools that we will explore today really briefly is Perplexity AI, Open Knowledge Maps, and Illicit AI. And while we're exploring these tools, I want you to consider and reflect on what exactly is your information need? And also consider what specific tasks and features that can help support in which scenario you are currently in with your topic. So first up, Perplexity AI, this is the interface and they have both a free version as well as a pro version. You can create an account to keep track of all of your prompts and information. In the search box, you can ask questions. Um, you could, for example, I think in a scenario where this tool can be helpful is finding background information. Or let's say I wanted to find synonyms um, for one of my concepts in my topic. Um, I'm going to then demo that. And here with the focus, um, this is where you can set parameters, but when you're starting your search, you don't want to set too many limitations. So here is the scenario. I wanted to find synonyms for a particular drug. And this is typically what is retrieved. It'll have a summary with um, in-text citation. And these are citations in which I can check and verify. You'll also notice here a list of icons. So I could, for example, give feedback to the tool. I can look at the entire list of references. I can also copy and paste this in another document, or I can make any edits to this query. And as I mentioned, it's really good to use this for background information. So if I wanted to know you know, the, the drugs, how do they look like? I can search images, I can search videos to get more information. And typically the tool will also have a list of related items, um, possible prompts that you could further explore. And that can also give you ideas on how to then direct, right, your topic. The other thing that I like about Perplexity is that you can share this for example, if you're working together with someone else on a project, you can share your prompt, what you found, and they could actually provide some follow-up to that prompt, create a link, send it back to you. So I think um, this is also helpful when you are um, exploring a topic. Next, we have Open Knowledge Map. This is an entirely open source tool. And one of its great features is it's visualization. And depending on your question, that you have two options in terms of sources. Um, so if you're in the life sciences, you can select PubMed. Um, otherwise, you can select base. And of course, you can set parameters, refining your search. But I would suggest to just do it really simply. It does recognize syntax. But again, you don't want to create something entirely robust. So for my scenario, uh, let's say I'm interested in childhood adverse experiences. So I'm gonna go ahead and put that in the search. And what generally happens is it will then, up to 100 relevant documents, um, it will then highlight um, different aspects or facets with respect to this topic. And this can be helpful if you're trying to determine a scope so you'll see all of these spheres and aspects, and you can explore these and to determine what would you find interesting. Um, the closeness of the circle suggests there are some similarities, but again, in each circle, there are unique records. And you see on the right-hand side, you can sort 
um, as you see fit. But again, I think really with this tool, the visualization is very helpful because it gives you a nice overview and then you can select an aspect. So going back to my scenario, right? Adverse childhood experiences, I find a particular sphere that I want to further explore. So I'm going into childhood adversity, adolescent health, right? Adult cardiometabolic. And when I further um, look into this particular bubble, I can see, wow, there's a lot of papers. I can um, dig in a little deeper. And that can also help me to then determine my question, right? So perhaps I can maybe look at particular outcomes, right? Adults who have experienced um, childhood adversity. Perhaps we wanna look at outcomes and then that could be a potential aspect. And the other thing about knowledge maps is that you can share your map. So if you are working uh, you know, with an advisor, right, on a master thesis, you can actually share this map and inform your advisor, here's my topic, I want to explore this aspect, what do you think? Um, and then they can actually look at those publications and provide further feedback. And if you want to save it, of course you can save. And this is also helpful for your documentation, right? Going back to um, if you are including AI technology, right? This is a way that you can capture in that point in time what you actually did with the technology. And lastly, we have Illicit AI. And they have three different workflows that you can use. They have a credit system. So you could try this for free. And if you try it, you will get a set of credits and explore the different features. If you want the Illicit Plus, which is a paid membership, right? You will be able to get some additional functionality. So we're gonna explore these workflows. So the first one would be to find papers. And I think it's optimal to, if you have a very specific question to ask it um, in a form of a question. And here is an example. So my question is how effective is mindfulness meditation on chronic pain patients. And typically it will summarize the top four papers. On the result list, you'll have eight papers that you can look at. You see here the summary with the links to the citations, right? Putting it into context. You can copy this, save it somewhere else. Or if you have an account, um, you can save it in your library. Here below, we have the papers, the abstract summary. This is generated by the AI. It even creates something more succinct. So each of the summaries is one sentence. And of course, you can get or extract further information with um, adding columns. Um, you can also filter if necessary. You can sort by most cited, least cited, most recent, least recent. And so here's a quick example. So let's say I wanted to get more information. I can go to the columns and they have some already suggested. So I would probably want to see, right, the study designs and particular outcomes. And that might give me some inspiration of where I wanna go with this topic. And here is what it looks like. And so you get a really nice a uh, textual overview of the different papers. And of course, if there is a particular paper or study that you're interested in, you can also select that particular study and find similar papers. And so that's another option. And of course, it will then resort and you can find papers that are more similar. The second workflow is where, let's say you already have papers. Maybe your advisor gave you some papers, or your team, right? You can then use this workflow. And in my scenario, I have three papers on climate change policy. And here you'll see, you'll get a notification when the papers are uploaded. And the nice thing with Elicit is that um, what you've uploaded, that's private to you. And again, if you want to extract some information, perhaps you didn't take a close look at these papers yet, you can select different things, you can also ask it, right? Um, find information regarding the particular policies or what are the limitations of these papers? And of course, sometimes the tool will be able to extract that, sometimes not, as you can see here, right? So some of the limitations were pulled out 
this particular paper didn't have, but of course you want to, um, at a later point, take a close look um, at those papers, especially if you're going to use them. And the last workflow is the list of concepts. And I think that this is really good in terms of if you are, for example, doing a systematic review, right? So we're not going to conduct a search for a systematic review, but let's say your topic is on a particular interventions you wanted to see what are other interventions that exist for this disease, you could see what it retrieves, or you can even use this as a way to validate what you and your team have discussed, right? Because typically at this point, you probably identified some key papers. Or for a scoping review, which the aim is to map concepts. Let's say you already have some concepts, but you want to use this to see what are other concepts that you can incorporate. And so here is one example. I wanted to find all of the non-medical interventions to improve psychological outcomes in a particular population. And you see we have here all of our list of concepts and each concept has a source connected to that. And so it's a, a way that you can verify and check. So here, for example, we have C. Murray from 2005. And when I click on that, I can then see the um, paper. So with that, and I know that was a really brief overview, um, Keep in mind that with AI tools, right, you want to take some things into consideration, but they are definitely a great starting point. Do consult, right, if you're doing a master thesis or dissertation, consult with your advisors on the policies regarding AI use. For those that are submitting journals, right, do review your target journal's policies. And of course, critically review and fact check everything and also continue to enhance your AI literacy skills. And for those that would like to learn more, um, a special shout out to the Research Support Services. Um, there is a living document with some tools that you can look at both for literature research as well as for writing. It is a living document, so we will be adding new tools and updating, but feel free to email us if you have any particular questions or even feedback, we would love to hear from you.